So welcome to our talk, how to build actions for smart displays and more devices. I'm Mandy Chan. I'm a developer advocate for the Actions on Google team. I'm very passionate about improving the developer experience. And that means I care about you and your experience on our platform. During Ma our talk, oh, sorry. It's OK. Um, during our talk, if you find something interesting and you want to share it, please use the hashtag AOGDEV on Twitter. <laughs> and I'm Darla. I'm a conversation designer on the Google Assistant. I work on how the Assistant looks and sounds across all our devices with the hope that it's consistent, useful, and dare I say, fun to use from time to time. Today, we're going to talk about how we combined our powers as a designer and a developer to create a custom action on Google and share with you what we learned along the way. So there are many different ways you can build for the Google Assistant. If you're an Android app developer, you can build what we call app actions. If you are a content owner, you can build uh, how-to actions or FAQ actions quickly by using our templates. In this talk, we will be focusing on building a custom action, in particular, a game action. You will leave this talk with a strategy on how to build a multi-model experience that scales across different devices. So you can see on the screen, we have different tools that we use to build this game. First one is Dialogflow. It makes it very straightforward to build a custom action. It turns unstructured natural language input into structured representation that my endpoint can consume. Under the hood, Dialogflow is built on the Google's machine learning and natural language understanding. Firebase is a mobile and web development platform that allows you to scale your application quickly. And for my game, I've used Cloud Function, Cloud Firestore, as well as Firebase Storage for my back-end integration. Mandy is covering the important tools you need in order to build a custom action. I'll be talking about how we applied solid conversation design principles to ensure it's a good experience. Lastly, Actions on Google is our developer platform that allows you developers to extend the functionality for the Google Assistant and build actions to make your user's life more productive, get things done quickly. So for I.O. this year, I've been building this game called Virtual Pet. My initial motivation was to understand from the developer perspective what it's like to build a game on our platform. Before we dive into the presentation, I want you to, uh, to give you a taste of how the game starts. And please pay attention to the animation in the background. Oh, look at this super cute pet store. Welcome to Super Pets Adoption Event. I'm so glad you're here. Are you interested in adopting a pet today? Not it. Yes, OK. <laughs> That's great. I'll be helping you today. It's nice to meet you. First things first, what's your name that you'd like to put on the adoption form? Well, Mandy. Nice to meet you, Mandy. Taking on a pet is a big responsibility, so if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a question or two. Now, a pet will need to be fed and exercised every day. Are you going to be able to feed and exercise your pet daily? I think so, so yes. That's great. You seem qualified to continue with the adoption. I'm somewhat of a matchmaker when it comes to matching pets with the right owner, and I think I have the perfect pet for you. They're cute, furry, and ready to be your best friend. Are you ready? Yes, I am totally ready. <laughs> the grand reveal. It's a hamster, just for you. So everyone meet Larry, my hamster, who inspired me to build this game. Larry is a little bit shy right now. Hey, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so 
This is a historic <laughs> moment. The first hamster who attend I.O. and co-presenting at Google I.O. stage. <laughs> so everyone, please give Larry a ball. <laughs> Now, this hamster needs a name. What do you think the name should be? Mandy, does this hamster have credentials? Well, just like everybody else who is attending Google I.O., we all have a badge. Larry is no exception. Tell her, why don't we show everyone Larry's I.O. badge? <laughs> well, he actually, that one is too big for him. We actually make a legit tiny one for Larry. <laughs> <laughs> the I.O. team is really like, excited that we have first hamster presenting at I.O. <laughs> OK, so, so I see his name there is Larry Walnuts. Right, according Larry to his, Walnuts is his full name. His identification. Okay. That's such a good name. Before you take your pet home, there's a few things to mention. Be sure to check on your pet every day, otherwise they may get sick or hungry. Ready to bring Larry home? Are we ready to bring Larry yes. home? Yes. So Larry's full-time job is taking a nap during the daytime. So today, he makes extra effort to come to I.O. <laughs> At nighttime, he likes to play. So why don't we let Larry get back to work and take a nap? Thank you, Taylor, for bringing Larry to the stage. <laughs> OK, so let's look at what Larry's home really looks right. like in How's the game. How does Larry's uh, home look like in a game? This looks like a very cozy home for Larry. As a caring owner, you'll be rewarded with badges. Collect the badges to unlock new food and toys for your pet. Now, do you want to feed or play with Larry? So as an extra surprise today, everybody look under your chairs. You get a hamster. You get a hamster. Everybody gets a Google hamster. <laughs> Just kidding. That's a terrifying proposal. Nobody's getting a hamster today. OK, let's get back to work. There are five important concepts that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about each of these in more detail. But before we do, let's touch on each of them briefly so everybody knows what to expect. So the first one is the voice experience is the foundation. When it comes to actions on Google, it's not the device or the screen that drives the experience. It's the voice. So when it comes to actions on Google, the voice experience is king. Second lesson that we want you to take away is use dialogue to guide the user. And what that really means is set expectation and drive your conversation forward by using questions instead of statements. We'll talk about how to use rich responses to augment your voice experience if your action uses a screen. Rich responses can visually augment your action, drive discoverability, and offload information from your TTS prompts. We will discuss how to use Interactive Canvas, a new feature that we just announced yesterday at I.O., mm -hmm. how to really use Interactive Canvas to create an immersive, dynamic gaming experience for the user. And finally, you're not building unique experiences per device. You're building one cohesive experience that scales. First, let's quickly talk about the assistant devices. When it comes to building an experience for the assistant, there are many ways and surfaces to reach users. What we're going to do today is help you, the developers, reach users through the 1 billion devices enabled with the Google Assistant. So by building actions on our platform, we help you reach billions of users. And all of these devices support different capabilities. Currently, we support five different capabilities. The first two are pretty straightforward. Does your device support screen output? And does your device support audio output? Web browsers is pretty straightforward, too. Um, does your device can show a web browser, for example, Chromebook and mobile phone? Media response uh, allows you to play long audio files. Lastly, custom stage. This is a new one that uh, related to interactive canvas. If your device can support interactive canvas, Right now, Interactive Canvas uh, are support on smart displays and Android phones. One thing in this slide I want to point out is, as a developer, you don't really know the type of devices that your user trigger your actions on. But you do know the capabilities of that device. 
Remember, that's all you can check, which is capabilities. So now that we've covered some of the overall capabilities of the device spectrum and how to account for them in the code, let's talk about how we managed to build one action that scales to the top three popular devices, smart speakers, mobile, and smart displays. These three devices cover all the Surface capabilities that Mandy just mentioned. So let's go through the game that we just demoed earlier, the virtual pet. In this game, you will first adopt a hamster and just like any real pet you have owned uh, in real life, you need to make sure they're happy by getting them lots of healthy food and exercise. As you can see, Larry loves food shopping. <laughs> I will take you through the actual process that we experienced when we were building the game, showing you the mistakes that we made so you can learn from them. Let's talk about how the game works and its flow. One of the motivations behind me building this game is to maximize the capabilities of different devices, to leverage the concept found in traditional gameplays, such as rewards, levels, and managing states. Let me walk through this diagram quickly. First, when you enter the game, you have to adopt the hamster. And then in the orange area, this is everything you can do after you adopt the pet. You can ask for the pet status. You can ask for what kind of badges have you earned. During the gameplay, you will be rewarded with different badges based on the activities that you do with your pet. Once you collect enough badges, you will progress to the next level. And the next level will allow you to unlock new toys for your pet. So when we started working together, one of the first questions we asked was, what device did we think we should focus on? For us, it was the smart display. We thought that beautiful screen could really help bring Larry to life. So we started with that and decided we'd focus on the other devices later. So let's talk about what the game was like before our collaboration, what it was like after, and the lessons we learned. So when I first built the game, I was very eager to jump into the gameplay, because that's where the magic happens. The images, the sound effects, and all the creative aspects that go into the game. For example, for the greeting experience of the game, I just jumped into what we call the default welcome intent. I didn't really think about the narrative, the beginning of the experience. Let's listen. Welcome to Virtual Pet Game. We have a lovely hamster waiting for a home. Before we get started, please tell me your name. As you just heard, the beginning experience was not very exciting. And it was really artwork that you just jump into and ask the user, what's your name? We need to give them the reasons before we ask for any information like that. And all of this changed when Dala asked me a few questions I didn't think before. When Mandy first showed me this game, one of the first questions I had before I even wanted to tell the name was, who's talking right now? Who's the we? And we have a lovely hamster waiting for a, for a home. I hadn't even started playing the game yet, and I was a little bit confused. The simple question, who is talking, actually has pretty profound implications for the work we needed to do. The primary one is that we needed to focus first on the voice experience. Thanks so much to our colleague Darren Hilton, who did this amazing artwork for this game. The artwork was solid. The voice experience needed a little work. So we backed up the train. Rather than immediately introducing the pet and asking for the user's name, we created an entirely new experience, a pet adoption experience. We start in a relatable way and getting the users engaged by asking them if they're ready to adopt a pet. Let's listen. Welcome to Super Pets Adoption Event. I'm so glad you're here. Are you interested in adopting a pet today? We'll talk more about the rest of the pet adoption experience here in a little bit, but the takeaway here is with a little bit of creativity and thinking about what might be a natural way to talk to your users, you can use dialogue to create a fun and engaging experience. So this is something we learned together. When we first asked ourselves should we, what device should we build for, that was a bit of a trap. It's common to trap to try and build for the smart display because it's got that screen, you can do so much with that screen, but it's not the screen that drives the experience, it's the voice. So one of the first and most impactful lessons, focus on the voice. But if the voice experience is the foundation, how do you do it well, especially if you've never done it before? 
We're going to walk through how conversation design applied to our game and then give you lots of resources at the end to learn more. You will see this experience enrichment pyramid throughout our talk. And overall, the idea is voice first is the foundation that we build on. Let's take a look at what that means. We developers, we tend to build applications that are linear. We do things in sequence. Before we created the pet store experience, the user was rushed into feeding the pet. Let's take a listen. Congratulations. You adopted Larry. Larry is a little hungry. Do you want to feed Larry some broccoli, a carrot, or sunflower seeds? So this approach is actually not good for voice-first experience. We don't do things in linear when you develop a voice application. So my question was, when Mandy showed me this, was, is feeding the pet all you can do? By presenting this one option, it sort of implied that that was it. So this, again, fairly simple question of what can you do has pretty profound implications. For us, it meant that we needed to solve what we often call the discovery problem. This is a common problem in voice interactions. If users can't see the options, how are they going to know what they can do? For us, there was many unresolved aspects that Mandy had built into the game that we needed to figure out how to share with users. So one thing you need to ask yourself is, how do you do this in the real world? If I want to tell you all the things you need to know, I don't just tell you all of the things right away. I tell you a little bit at a time in a way that makes sense using something we call progressive disclosure. So we built in this pet store experience to the beginning of the game so that we could use progressive disclosure to have an engaging conversation with the user. So after the user has entered the pet store, we built in a pre-adoption interview to teach the user the game. Think about what happens when you adopt a pet. They want to make sure you're going to be able to take care of it, right? Let's take a listen. Nice to meet you. Taking on a pet is a big responsibility, so if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a question or two. Now, a pet will need to be fed and exercised every day. Are you going to be able to feed and exercise your pet daily? So with this one prompt, we were able to do two really important things. One, we taught the user that this is not a one-time game that you play once and don't come back. We wanted you to come back every day, take care of your pet like you would a real pet. So this is one way we hope to drive engagement. Another thing we mentioned here is that you need to feed and exercise your pet. So now we use dialogue to teach the user the expectations of the game. So another big lesson here, when you have the multimodal experience and you focus on the voice, dialogue is how the action gets moved forward. Have fun, use progressive disclosure to guide the user. One important thing to keep in mind when using dialogue to drive the experience forward is you want to always make sure it's really clear when it's the user's turn to talk. Use questions. The more focused the question, the better. There's a few things to keep in mind when creating a complete voice experience. Once you start building dialogues, keep in mind for every yes path, there's a no path. So for the question we had, are you ready to adopt a pet today? Nope. What's your action going to do? What if the user says something outside of the very one specific thing you intend for them to say? So if I say, are you ready to adopt a pet today? Potato. <laughs> What's your action going to do? It's important that you have a way to get your users back on track. So by nature, your voice experience needs to have several branches here. So this way, you've encountered not only for the one thing you expect users to say, but all the things they reasonably can say. If your action doesn't have many branching paths, you've probably only built for one instead of all of them. So let's look at a couple of ways we added branching into Mandy's game. So one, when a user comes back to this game, depending on how long it had been since they had played, they'd be greeted with a different greeting. Depending on whether they were a good owner, an iffy owner, or a bad owner, they'd hear a different prompt. Even within these modules of good owner, if owner, and bad owner, we have several variants within that. This is important, especially with games like this that you expect users to come back many times. You want to make sure that they're greeted in a dynamic way and not always getting the same experience. Another way that we added in some branching to Mandy's game was, now that users know how to feed and exercise their pet, 
What happens if they don't stop? They could potentially get stuck in what we call an infinite loop. This is harder to do in visual interfaces, but is a common trap in voice interactions if you're not careful. So what we did was build in a mechanism to track how many times that day they had interacted with the action by feeding or exercising their pet. If they reached the threshold, now instead of continuing forever, they'd get a notification that was saying, hey, your pet is really tired or full. Come back tomorrow to interact with your pet. So we talk about this, um, the importance of building a voice-first experience. Dala just mentioned branching out your dialogue is one way. There are two other simple yet powerful ways to create that solid voice-first experience. First one is SSML, which allows you to create layers for your actions. You can create pauses. You can change the volume and pitch of the voice. You can even add ambient sound in the background when the spoken prompt is playing. Second one is for developers who don't have a professional audio team. We at Google provide you the sound library you can use to create that immersive experience. What I like about the sound library is it's organized by categories. You can find animal sounds, cartoons, science fiction. It's even searchable. So another thing is it's completely free. So take advantage of them and use it in your game or any categories of actions. In the demo I showed earlier that as the user walk into the pet store, you can hear the bells ringing above the door. That alerts the pet store owner someone has entered the store. This all can help you to create that narrative, really great beginning gaming experience. Now we are going to touch on the visual components that apply to all the devices with a screen by using which responses. Now we're going up a level in the pyramid. At this tier, we are trying to engage with the user with more of their senses. With smart displays, in addition to voice, you can now engage with the user by showing images on the screen, and they can select the item by touch. This is where the multimodal experience begins. We do this by using which responses, such as basic cards, carousels, and suggestion chips. By following this pyramid strategy I just mentioned, if the user plays the game on a speaker, you will hear the sound of a hamster munching in the background. Let's listen. So you can find all kind of different interesting sound from our sound library for your actions. So the initial version of the game, I really want to make use of the features that are available for the developer at that time. And that was before Interactive Canvas. So I make use of the rich responses. Majority of them are basic cards to fully leverage a beautiful artwork created by my coworker, Darian. Um, as you can see, the image itself can convey a lot of information. It doesn't just show the activity of the pet is doing, but also the emotion of the pet. One of the benefits of your action having a screen is now you're able to display multiple options at the same time. This can be a little bit tricky in the voice-only experience because users have to keep that information in their head. But now, with the screen, you can present multiple options and obviously get the benefit of being able to augment those options with a visual representation. There's a couple things to keep in mind here when trying to balance the two modalities of voice and screen. If you've got a small number of options, like three, maybe four, you probably don't need to change your prompt from your voice-only experience. It's perfectly fine to say, I have a few options, A, B, or C. Which one do you want? But if you have more options, four or more, then it's probably a good idea to offload some of that information from your prompts to show the user the screen. So then you can just say, here's a few options. Which one do you want? So for this game specifically, there are two opportunities that we can leverage the carousel. What should I feed my pet, or what can I do with my pet? In this example is, what can I feed the pet? With the carousel, the user can either select the item by saying that I want a broccoli or by touching the screen. Keep in mind that you should have a minimum of two items 
or maximum 10 items for carousels. Now let's talk about how to create a carousel in code. We first create a new instance of carousel, passing in multiple options, in this case, broccoli and carrot. And then for each item, we have a key broccoli. When the user selects the item, the value broccoli will be sent back to the server. And each item, we have a title, description, and next is the image. And they have also a odd attribute for accessibility. Now, you have learned about how to create a carousel in code. It is very important to optimize your TTS, test to speech for voice and screen. What that really means is pretty much like me giving a presentation. Do you want me to read the word um, from the screen word for word? You don't. So you don't want your action to behave the same. The solution for this is pretty simple. Make sure your spoken prompt and the display tests are different. Here's how I do it in code. So I first import in two prompts, one switch prompt and the other one is static prompt. And that's just my personal preference that I like to separate those files. When I say which prompt, what I really mean is the display test that you show on the screen. Next. So here, the highlighted line is just sending out the spoken prompt, which the device will say. It is a part of building the voice first experience. I want you to be aware of before you send any visual component like basic card, carousel, make sure you send the static. Uh, the simple response first. If you don't do this, you might get an error. Finally, if we do have a device that supports screen, we can show the image of the basic card with the reach prompt. Another useful rich response to use is suggestion chips, which is a nice way to continue or pivot the conversation. A few things to keep in mind when using suggestion chips. The first one is less is more. The more chips you put on the bottom of the page, the more implicit work you're asking the user to do to figure out which one they need or want. Use less, do the work for the user, and only surface a few highly relevant chips. The second thing to keep in mind is that these are meant to augment your feature by highlighting secondary features. With smart displays, you can't ever really be sure that the user's standing right in front of the device. So if you expect them to use this as their primary modality, they may not even be looking at it. So use this as a way to surface secondary features for your action. So as Dala mentioned, suggestion chips can help you pivot the conversation. In this game, there are two suggestion chips. First one is how to get badges so that the user know that are they progressing in the game. The second one is how is the pets doing. This is a great way to do the progressive disclosure Let's see how we do that in code. It's pretty straightforward. Again, you're creating a new instance of suggestions. You can pass in a single string or an array of strings. Depending on what are you passing in, we can create a single suggestion chip or multiple suggestion chips. So, so far, we have covered a lot of useful rich responses, basic cards, carousel, and suggestion chips. We have several more, though, that can help you enrich your multimodal experience. First is list. List is pretty much like carousel, except you can show more items. An immediate response really allows you to play long audio file and let, you, let the user navigate the audio file. Table, on the other hand, can allow you to display information in row or column format. We have more resources at the end of the presentation to show you how to use each of them. The lesson to be learned here are two things. Make sure you engage with your user on a visual level. Make sure the second, way, the second one is um, provide a natural progressive discovery without being so explicit by using which responses. So we have talked about this pyramid throughout our talk. I just want to have a quick recap. SSML and sound library allows you to express the creativity through sound, and that allows you to be a solid voice for experience. Which responses let you present images, but they are slightly limited. That means that you cannot customize them. At the top of the pyramid is where we have the interactive canvas, 
that can allow you to create the deepest level of experience by using interactive canvas. This is a new feature we announced yesterday, and it, it empowers you to create a fluid and customized experience with the technology you are already familiar with, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I like to say this is where the creativity erupts like a volcano, because Canvas allows you to be very expressive, which is ideal for a game. Right now, this is only available for game. On the other hand, which responses, you can use them for any categories of actions. You can see what's on the screen. Mm. This can all be done wow. with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. With interactive Canvas, you can easily create dynamic animations. Canvas let the user touch on any element on the screen, and, the screen, and they can react. None of this was possible before Canvas. So we needed to figure out, how are we going to use Canvas for our game? When the users come back to the game, Larry or your hamster, however you've named them, can be in any number of states. They can be happy. They could be hungry, holding his little belly, thinking you're never going to feed him. He could even be sleeping. So what we wanted to be sure to do was make it clear for the user how what they're doing for their pet is affecting the pet based on all of the complexity that Mandy had built into the game. So now let's take a look about how we replaced rich responses with Canvas. Like I said earlier, I built this game when Canvas was available. So I use a lot of like, rich responses, such as basic cards and carousel in my game. In this, in this example, when the user choose let the pet run in a hamster ball, my intent with the spoken prompt is to show that Larry is happy, Larry still have energy to play. But what I didn't think about is, how does that affect the end user gameplay? What if the user keep playing and feeding the pet? My game, the initial version, would just keep displaying the same images. Instead of just showing a basic card that shows Larry doing the activity, now with Canvas, we can build in something much more interactive. For example, we could put in dynamic elements on the display. In this case, it allows us to show an energy bar for Larry. So in addition to show the energy and happiness level of your pet by using the energy bar, we also want to show the user how they can progress in the game by collecting different badges. With which responses, I had a difficult decision to make. Should I show Larry the hamster eating the broccoli, or should I show the badge? So before interactive canvas was available, I actually used a screen to show that um, Larry's eating the broccoli, and I used a spoken prompt to tell the user they earn a badge. I think that was, when using rich responses, a pretty smart way to balance the modalities. But now that we have Canvas, where we can now show multiple images on the same screen, and some of them even being dynamic, like a GIF here, now you can see not only how Larry's feeling with the energy bar, but you can also see how you're progressing through the game by earning badges. So the lesson learned here is, with interactive Canvas, objects on the screen can come to life with a single touch. They can react by fading, animating, or even talking to you. So now we've covered how to build for voice only and also for multimodal. Of the three products we spoke about at the beginning of the talk that we were going to build our action for, the one that we haven't talked about is mobile. So what do we need to do, based on what we've done so far, to get our action to work on mobile? The good news is absolutely nothing. By using this strategy of building from voice to rich responses and augmenting with Canvas if it applies to your category, then you don't have to do anything to extra for mobile to work specifically. This is a big win for you. By doing this solid approach, you can scale to many devices without a lot of heavy lifting on your part. So there are some use cases that the phone is preferred over other devices. There are about three use cases, transaction, notification, account linking, are good examples. They all have a common theme, which is the physical control over the device. Mobile is a massive market that you don't want to miss. It is a great way for you to engage with the user on the go or in a more private manner. So there are different scenarios that requires users to transfer from one device to another for different reasons. 
One reason is you need to do account linking. So that requires the users to use their phone for, secu sec for security reasons. The second reason could be you need to show an image. But what if your user triggers your action from a home speaker? So what we can do is we check if the user has any devices that can support screen output. If the user does have a screen, uh, device that supports screen output, we simply continue the conversation over there. Let's see how we do that in code. So first, we check if the user has any devices that can support screen output. And we saw that in a constant called screen available. We then define three constant contacts. Context is the reason why we need to transfer the user from one device to another. Notification is the message that will be displayed on the screen on the target device. Capabilities is an array of capabilities that your target device must support. In this case, all we care is the device should have a screen. So if the current device that's being used, we have a screen, we can show the image, carousel, basic card, easily. And if the current device that's being used that doesn't support screen, this is where we check the constant screen available. Does the user have any other device that can support screen output? If yes, we create a new instance uh, called new service that pass in the three constants that we defined earlier. Finally, if uh, we need to go to the next page. <laughs> uh, finally, if the user doesn't have any device that can support screen output, we simply say, sorry, you need a screen to, use to see the pictures. So we managed to cover how to take one action, focus on the capabilities, create a solid voice experience that scales. As you try this yourselves, here's a few tools to keep in mind that can be really helpful. It's easy to get lost in your code when you're trying to figure out how to balance these two modalities. I highly recommend stepping away from the computer using a pen and paper and figuring out how you want these dialogues to flow with the voice and screen back to back. This is really simple, and you do not need very much skill to do this. A simple drawing with a pen, a paper, and some stick figures goes a long way. UI Toolkit includes some image templates that can allow you to create a wireframe. It shows you how which responses can look in different devices. In this example, we have basic cards. You can really see how it looks on a mobile versus a smart display. Another tool that I want to talk about is the Action Simulator, where you can find in the Actions on Google Console. So this is where you probably spend a lot of time testing your actions. A couple of things I want to touch on is uh, the first is you can really toggle between those devices to see how your action look like. And you can also check um, how your canvas, interactive canvas, look like in the simulator. Second thing I want to talk about is the audio tag. This is where you can play. Uh, can we click? Yeah, this is the audio tag in case anyone couldn't find it. Uh, this is where you can play with the SSML tag, add pauses, change volume, pitch of your voice, and even add the ambient sound in the background while the speaking prompt is running. So OK, we have done it. We have covered a lot today. To sum up, we just want to run through the quick summary of what we have learned from building this game. We talk about using SSML in conjunction with the sound library that can help you create layers for your action. Be sure to have several branches in your dialog to create a solid voice-first experience. Then use dialog to guide the user using questions instead of statements. If your action uses a screen, there are a lot of tools in your rich response toolbox to augment the voice experience. Interactive Canvas is a great new feature to create gaming experience using technology you already know, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. If you're a game developer, make sure you check it out. It is in developer preview, which means you can start building games today. You just cannot deploy it to the production yet. And finally, if you build one custom action using the techniques we described today, you get a single experience that scales across devices. We covered a lot today about how conversation design uh, applies to our action, but there's lots more to learn. I highly recommend visiting the actions.google.com slash design website to learn more about conversation design. And there's also been lots of good talks from years prior. 
There's also a talk tomorrow at 2.30 by Kathy Pearl and Jessica Early Cha on stage eight, where you can learn more about design and quality conversations for the Google Assistant. And to learn more about how to use interactive Canvas and how to implement it in the code, there was a talk earlier today that you can check out tomorrow on YouTube. So here are all the resources that we have covered today, how to leverage the voice and visual component that our platform provides. In addition to that, samples and tools that can help you get started quickly. Thank you so much for coming. Please let us know how do you like this talk. I hope you enjoy this talk and share the feedback in the I.O. app. So this game is still work in progress. So that means that we will open source this game after I.O. Follow me on Twitter at MandyChanNYC to get the latest update about the game and Larry. OK. Have fun That's building it. your action. Thanks for coming.